Thank you, everyone, for coming out, and thank you for all being champions of freedom. Because Bitcoin is about freedom, and it's about private property. And if you do not have private property, you do not have private property rights, you will not have human rights. And they're deeply connected. And it's just so simple to recognize and organize your thoughts this way. My presentation is going to stay macro. I'm going to try to provoke you with some thoughts of looking at this world as a quant money managers. I'm going to walk you through a bit of the history of the creation of the first crypto mining company to go public and the concept and how to think about binomial models. So this is my famous disclaimer page. And before anyone invests in Bitcoin or a crypto mining company, it's so important to understand the DNA of volatility. They say that the tallest people in the world are the Dutch. They say that there's a different DNA. They have what we call this DNA also works in capital markets. So each asset class has its own DNA of volatility. And volatility can make you fearful or it can make you extremely hopeful if you have a system to navigate through it. So as you can see, gold and the S&P have about the same da daily volatility. That means 70% of the time, it is a non-event for gold or S&P to go up or down 1% in over 10 days, plus or minus 3%. The really exciting part is when it moves up two standard deviations over 10 days, and the difficult spot is when it falls 10% or 3% over 10 days. But as you can see here, Bitcoin is much more volatile. Tesla is more volatile. MicroStrategy, Michael Saylor's famous company, is also much more volatile. Equity markets and gold stocks are always much more volatile than bullion. And mining is also much more volatile, crypto mining companies, than Bitcoin. And when you recognize that, you can use this DNA of volatility to your favor. So looking at the world in zeros and ones because the internet is based on zeros and ones. And the zeros and ones actually give you a triangle. They give you an outcome. They can, and this tree of binomials is what we live with. So when we take a look at this triangle of conflict, this conflict can be at home, it can be at work, and it can definitely be in politics. And clearly what you see with this triangle of conflict is the media loves to be the hero. And the villain are all miners, crypto miners, Bitcoin people. They're deemed to be this villain. And society is the victim. Now you can have this at home where your child wants to do something, and the mother says no, and the child runs to the father, and all of a sudden the father is to become the hero. And once that father tries to become the hero, they are now in big conflict. And it's to recognize how the media casts the villain, the victim, and government, and government agencies. So how we are in a position when we think that we are actually the heroes, and we are the victims. And society as a whole are uneducated and uninformed, and they are the victims. They will become the villains. So how does this triangle affect you from your personal life to can you quickly understand when you see conflict in the media, are they really a hero? Are they really a victim? And are they really a villain? And in these sort of volatile times that we live with, it's time to be stoic and go back to the, one of the greatest emperors ever, Marcus Aurelius. And one of the big breakthroughs of Marcus Aurelius in a binomial world and looking at the world is to be consumed with what you control, not with what you don't control. Now, in my experience of a gold fund manager and written books on gold and have 100,000 readers in 80 countries that read my content every week, it's interesting that when I first left Canada and moved to Texas almost half of my life ago, it was these, these gold funds I had had an audience of gold investors. And what I found 
was that those gold investors actually own little gold. But they were the most vocal, and they were really just anti-government. And they missed really what the argument was, and they didn't actually make a commitment. And sometimes today, in my experience, I've seen some Bitcoiners that are very, very emotional of things they don't control and very bellicose towards others, and I believe they don't own that much Bitcoin. So one has to be able to separate what you control versus what you can't control. We can't control the weather, but we can control, do we get an umbrella, a raincoat, boots? This is what we control. And how do we control the emotions of the markets and the emotions of a regulatory world coming down with these pronouncements is to step back and try to understand these dynamics of what government agencies and, and what politicians actually think and what they're doing. And I'm going to try to walk you through sort of a brief history the way I look at it. I think I need a little help here to move this slide forward. No. Yeah. Let's go back one. There we go. I believe this whole creation of the concept of private property started with the Magna Carta in 1215 because the state owned everything, the king. And the landowners who basically owned some land, the king had the right to take away. So really the king owned everything until there was going to be a war internally. And there were little fractions around 1215 of a civil war in England in this battle of separating. And everyone thinks of just church and state. Really, it's about private property. And in that journey of creating private property were human rights that the king didn't have the right to come in and throw you in jail. The king didn't have the right to go through what's called trial by ordeal. So this is very significant, but it wasn't a straight line. It's had so many ups and downs over 800 years. And so when we take a look at this binomial world, you can see common law versus civil law. Common law, civil law, common law is private property. Bitcoin, I would say, falls under private property, not state property. And we take a look at capitalism prospered under common law because capitalism needs to have private property and needs to have human rights. That's how it functions. Communism, no private property rights. Everything's owned by the state. So the power base goes to the top. And then we have decentralized money versus centralized money. And for centuries, decentralized money has been known as gold and gold and silver coins. And over time, there's always been a debasement or dilution of the silver coin in particular and the gold coin. And the same concern is today with Bitcoin and paper money. And in that journey we see of common law being created in the 1300s in England, there are patent laws coming out. And one of the most famous patents that came out was from a Flemish glass blower that had a patent in England. And then the dome that's over top of the famous Florence Cathedral, the, the architect behind that, Brunicelli, he received a patent. So the idea and the concept of property rights and what the Medicis did is interesting because they functioned under a, a world of civil law. They started creating separation of state law and civil law, and they created what were letters of credit, which we use today, a banking system, holding companies, that idea of separating and creating something private, an important concept, and the idea that interest rates all of a sudden you could pay people and it wasn't a use to recharge if you allow the citizens to earn money if they bought soldiers to protect from the city-state wars and that led to the evolution of the bond market. But during this whole period, we've seen the growth in communism. 
And this is the Frankfurt School in the 60s, and they realized that you couldn't basically force communism in America, in many nations in Europe, in Canada, because we respected a great business person. And that great singer, that great athlete, that person that has some significant gift, were allowed to make a lot of money, and that money could turn around and buy other things, and they had private property, and they had human rights. So what they went out with was a model to infiltrate schools and just look for inequalities, that their idea would be the hero, and it was somehow sued where the bad guy versus the good guy to protect, and it was always a methodology to strip away assets. And it's been very successful. It's been very successful for what we deal with today with political correctness and what we do with what they love to call now in America, wokeism. This whole thought process is all actually started a long time ago. Common law started over 800 years ago. And it's not been a straight line. And so we just go through these pendulum swings and the important part is how do you sit back? How do you stand back and say, what do I control and what do I not control? And how do I navigate through this? So we see the World Economic uh, Organization, the, uh, the, uh, sorry, the World Economic Forum is becoming the, the bad organization, NGO for not good organization, because of this sort of righteous way. And actually, it's just civil law to come in to dictate for everyone in the world. But they have tremendous tremendous reach that how the head of the World Economic Forum can go and spend three hours with a major, this, the, the executive of, the, of a major American agency. When businesses in America, the CEO can't spend three hours with that agency. And how they're trying to dictate a lot of policies. And the World Economic Forum now wants to turn around for countries to give them the right to shut down your country if someone at the top of the World Economic Organization deems this is a global crisis. That one person has tremendous power. Go back in time. That is state power. That is civil law. So we all know this guy well. But there's always this imbalance, and I learned this in the world of gold. There will always be imbalances between government policies. As you can see here, it's a binomial model. Government policies are either monetary or fiscal. Monetary is either interest rates or money supply, and fiscal is tax and regulations and spend. So you see this growth of a binomial model takes complexity and simplifies it for, for us to digest it. And what you see here is that there'll always be imbalances. And I have found that the greater the imbalance in that country's policies, the more significant gold has been as an asset class. Until along came Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is part of the demographics, innovation, and the new digital world. That it is a balancing factor when you have big imbalances between any government's monetary and fiscal policy. And then we have the great adoption. And my best metaphor of a great adoption and Metcalfe's Law are, are Andy Warhol paintings. Then when the paintings first came out, they were $1,000. They went to a quarter million dollars. And they came out, and all you needed to have was adoption. At first, people, many people said Andy Warhol's crazy, his art's bizarre, he deals with a counterculture. And over time, the adoption took place with a limited supply each year of Mao, just a different color. Those pieces of art took off. And I believe it's so important for us to embrace the adoption. So decentralized versus centralized assets, art and paper money, is decentralized, gold is decentralized, and Bitcoin is decentralized. Hive, I could not start in 2017 an ETF in Bitcoin. And still to this day in America, it's not happened. And I realized that, so I was fortunate enough to be able to be a co-founder in the creation of the first crypto mining company. And that's Hive Blockchain, and the whole management team is here. And, and you can meet the management team and you can talk about what we've done, but we've been in innovators. We recycle heat from one building to the other five times greater, using hydroelectricity to mine Bitcoin and then recycle it to heat a building that makes whirlpools. And next is to build greenhouses. 
So this concept of innovation is so important in this crypto ecosystem. And Hive is very proud about having the most efficient, highest average Bitcoin per hash rate and also the lowest GNA per petahash. But the future, the future is the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network is a key component of the future. And the Lightning Network attracts intellectual capital and it needs money. So Hive is investing in protocols such as ordinals that use the best distributed network in the world. Something like 40,000 nodes, 13,000 active, and there's only 250 countries. Talk about a decentralized world. And now all of a sudden, the most important part for something that grasps the world is culture of art. And art and using the Bitcoin, the safest permissionless network in the world, is so important to attract other adopters. And we have Satoshis, and we found out that we have Satoshis, and there's 100 million Satoshis per Bitcoin. And we had, we had 250 that had a value of one penny, and we said those special numbers were worth a quarter million dollars. So if you limit the supply of Bitcoin, it goes up, and all of a sudden now you're discovering that if you limit the number, and you have special number Satoshis, they go up like Andy Warhol art. It's about adoption. It's about bringing in an inclusive world of other people to use this. But it's not that all governments are bad. It's that there'll be big imbalances. And to remember that private property is, is the key to human rights. And the last part of this whole future growth is AI. AI of how we build our facilities, AI of how we mine which coins, and AI of what we're building out our data centers. So we're the first to buy our own data centers, and now we're building out rapidly our AI protocols. But it doesn't matter right now. All the crypto mining companies are stuck in a basket, a basket maybe run by Citadel, and they pivot and move by the minute with the price of Bitcoin. If Bitcoin is up, we're all up. Bitcoin is down, we're all down. And the differentiator is those companies that have the biggest hodl or those companies that have the biggest exahash. And that's where you get a difference in market cap valuations. But day in, day out, minute by minute, it's all off of Bitcoin pricing. And to me in the world coming from gold, gold dictates all the other commodities price movement. So if gold is in a bear market, it impacts others. If Bitcoin is in a bear market, it impacts the whole ecosystem. So stay bullish on the Bitcoin. Understand, don't become emotionally caught up in attacking governments. Attack policies. And I think you'll be a lot healthier. Bring your umbrella when it's raining. Have your raincoat. Have your rubber boots. And don't complain about the rain. Because with the rain comes beautiful plants. And keep investing in our infrastructure, and may you all be blessed with an abundance of health and happiness. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee, a city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.